Let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now we will sing our hymn of the month, Creator Spirit by Jesus. Christ has given to his church on earth to forgive the sins of repentant sinners, but to withhold forgiveness from the unrepentant as long as they do not repent. Where is this written? And then, uh, yeah, I'll read the first part and then we can read the um, rest of John 20 together. This is what St. John the Evangelist writes in chapter 20, and then we'll read all this together because the bold got a little messed up there. The Lord Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. John chapter 20, verses 22 and 23. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And Luther's morning prayer, 
I thank you, my Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have come into this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. Teach you. Alright, so uh, first on the, the hymn, my uh, thought of this week while we were singing um, was about how the Holy Spirit is, the function of the Holy Spirit within the Trinity is really a beautiful thing. And the function of the Holy Spirit within the Trinity is to deliver to us the gifts that Christ sends, right? So the um, church has always made a big deal, this is in the Creed, that the Holy, Spirit, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, right? And even the Eastern Orthodox who say that he only proceeds from the Father and he's sent by the Son, but he doesn't proceed from the Son, which is a whole hair-splitting theological debate, um, still make a big deal that he proceeds from the Father and that he's sent by the Son. And that is to say that, so, so when, when the Spirit proceeds, when he's sent, where does he go? Well, he goes into the hearts of believers, and he goes to the church, right? It's Pentecost. And so that function of being the person of the Trinity that, that comes from the Father and the Son and comes to the believer, this is the, the connection, the, the primary connection of the believer to the Trinity, <clears throat> the believer to God. And uh, now, as we said last week, Anything that any person of the Trinity does, the other two people, the other two persons of the Trinity are involved in. So act as, you know, creator spirit by his aid, the world's foundations first were laid. The spirit and the son are both involved in the act of creation, not just the father. Uh, likewise, the father and the son are involved in connecting to the heart of the believer, not just the spirit. Um, and maybe the best place to see that is the Lord's Supper where Jesus himself and his bodily presence comes to us. That being said, when we do think about the Spirit, um, I think one good way to think about it is this way, is that in our baptism, we are, we are connected uh, in this intimate way to the glory of the Trinity. And you can see that throughout the hymn. So uh, part of the prayer that's being prayed here to the Spirit is that... He would continue to enliven our hearts and connect us to the Trinity, right? So, um, pour your joys on humankind, um, the bearer of God's gracious might in stanza two, our hearts with heavenly love inspire. Your sacred healing message bring to sanctify us as we sing. Uh, all of this is uh, your giver of grace, descend from high, your sevenfold gifts to us supply. All right, all of this is about the Holy Spirit coming from the Father and the Son, coming from uh, and, and bringing to us the reality of the Trinity in our hearts. Help us eternal truths receive and practice all that we believe. Give us yourself that we may see the glory of the Trinity. Um, I mean, it's just all over here. Uh, and then I really, I really like this line, the beginning of stanza four, which is a, whenever, whenever you have one of those triangle stanzas, you know, that we stand for, yeah. um, that's a, it's a doxological stanza, that's what they're called, doxological, which means a, a doxological means to glorify in, in Greek, and um, it, it's kind of the word for worship uh, in, in Greek, that's how it's translated often. And so, uh, doxological stanzas have, are basically Trinitarian stanzas that um, glorify the Trinity. So, it, it's basic, doxological stanzas are primarily a, a rewording uh, of the Gloria Patri that we say, like at the end of 
the intro and at the end of the psalm and throughout the throughout the liturgy glory be to the father and to the son and to the holy spirit as it was in the beginning is now and will be forever uh doxological stances are basically a rewording of that in hymnody so anyway uh so in this one we have immortal honor endless fame attend the almighty father's name the savior's son be glorified for all human kindness died to you o paraclete we raise our endless songs of that unending songs of thanks praise. So, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's a doxological stanza pra praising the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But anyway, I really like the um, the way that it. So you're praying. This whole hymn is praying to the Spirit, right? And it kind of works that prayer to the Spirit in with the other two persons of the Trinity. So, what does the Spirit do for the Father's name? It attends the Almighty Father's name, right? So that. For us, the Spirit that's living in us, that's connecting us to the Father, it's the Spirit is attending the Father's name in our hearts, right? That we would, like, it, it's kind of like, a, you know, like if a butler is, is serving food to his mas master's family, right? Um, he's attending them. He's, he's tending to them, right? Well, the, what the Spirit is doing to us, it's, it's he's serving up. The Father for us, right? He's giving us the Father right there. So attend the Al Almighty Father's name. I think that's a, a great line. And then uh, the Savior Son be glorified. So the uh, that that the Spirit would cause us to glorify the Son before all human kind has died. And then finally to you, O Paraclete, we raise unending songs of thanks and praise. So anyway, that's uh, that's my thought on the hymn today. Is that 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 function of the Holy Spirit of bringing to us this connection uh, with the Trinity that we pray for is a beautiful thing. I think next week I want to talk about all the numbers, uh, which I almost talked about today. Uh, sevenfold gifts, thrice holy, found thrice holy fire. I want to talk about those numbers next week. So don't let me forget. Um, sometimes I have more than one thought when we're singing the hymn, but then I don't know what to, what to do. Um, all right. For the catechism, uh, we've been in this section on confession and absolution, and I've been making the case that uh, the catechism is talking about private confession and absolution, which fell out of practice in the Lutheran Church, which I don't really understand why, um, because that is what the tradition of the church is, and Luther fixed the Roman Catholic version of private confession and absolution where they added penance and good works uh, which is obviously uh, false and heretical but uh, he did keep private confession and absolution because private confession and absolution is a great and comforting gift for the person who has the burden conscience who can come to their pastor and say this sin really bothers me. I know that the Bible says God forgives all sins, but I just don't know if God could really forgive this sin. And then the pastor hears that sin and says, in the stead of Christ, you are for that sin is forgiven here just as it is before God. That's a beautiful comfort. Um, and that's what happens in John 20 when Jesus says to the disciples, and he ordained, basically ordains the disciples here. He breathes on them and gives them the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, and that there is, throughout the Bible, whenever ordination is talked about, there's always this connection to this special, the, a special gift of the Spirit. I mean, Paul talks that there are, there, are, there are special gifts of the Spirit, right? And some are given to prophesy, some are given to preach. And so there, the ordination is a special gift of the Spirit. That's why this is tangential, but that's why uh, we, whenever we do the salutation um, in the liturgy here, and I say, the Lord be with you, and what do you say? And also with you. you. <laughs> uh, so that is, uh, and also with you, was it a modern update of what, what do we say here? What do we say here in our liturgy? Come on. You guys know this. We do it every week. <laughs> and with thy spirit. And with thy spirit. Oh, Thank yes. you. Rose grew up in the yeah. Rose knows. Um, 
<laughs> so in the 1980s, th this is worth talking about. In the, in the 1980s, they updated um, some of the liturgy from, so that the old uh, Lutheran hymnal, the TLH, had what we would call like King James English, right? Jacobian English, uh, in the liturgy. So the eyes and thou's and so on and so forth. And rightly so in the 1980s, they were like, well, that's not how people talk anymore. Liturgy should be in the vernacular, so they updated it. And their, the salutation used to say, the Lord be with you and with thy spirit. And they said, oh, that's just Jacobian English. And uh, they weren't really thinking about it. And they said, well, let's change it to and also with you. Um, what, they, what they left out is it's not the thy that matters. It's the spirit part that matters. Because whenever the congregation responds to the pastor and with thy spirit, um, they're not, it's not just saying, oh, and with your soul, right? Because I think that's kind of how they took it was that they, they were thinking, oh, spirit there just means like that that, that person has a soul. Mm -hmm. And so we're just going to say and also with you because you can mean, you know, body and soul or whatever. Um, the spirit part is actually connected to the pastor's ordination. That's that's what you're what you're remembering whenever you're saying with thy spirit is that that's the guy that was ordained that was given this gift of the holy spirit uh by the laying on of hands as the bible teaches pastors should be uh ordained by the laying on of hands uh this this pastor was given that spirit to administer these gifts that he's about to give me right so when do we do the salutation we do the salutation twice in the liturgy uh, once is in near the beginning of the service at the beginning kind of of the service of the word so uh, Right before the prayer of the church So we get through the like intro it and the kind of opening liturgy and then it's the salutation The Lord be with you and with thy spirit and that's because he's about to read the lessons and then preach to you right and so you want his sermon to be filled with the spirit and then second is right before the administration of the Lord's Supper. Uh, that's the, the, the preface of the, the Lord's the, um, the preface of the Lord's Supper. So uh, the Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is meet and right so to do. Um, and today is actually a good day to talk about this because we're switching over to a different setting of the divine service. Uh, because we're into the season after Trinity now, and we got about six months of it being green, and you know, I think it's a nice variety to do at least two settings of the divine service. So we're switching up back to the yes, this divine service setting one, uh, which is a little bit different music, but basically all the same words, a little bit different order of a few things, um, but but basically all the same stuff, but. Divine Service Setting 1 is one of the service settings in the Lutheran Service Book, which I disagree with the editors of the Lutheran Service Book on this, which they kept, and also with you. And I said, no, 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 you're, you're missing that. You're, you're not, you're, you're missing, misunderstanding that. Um, and actually, it was after the Lutheran Service Book came out in 2006 that a professor at my alma mater, the, one of the seminary in Fort Wayne, uh, researched all this, because he was like, why did we change it to an also with you? What happened to the Spirit? And he researched all this and wrote an article that I can share with you if you want, uh, describing the history of and with thy spirit and why that's connected to ordination. Um, a guy by the name of uh, Timothy Quill, he's a spent most of his career as a foreign missionary, actually. But anyhow, um, so the spirit in ordination is an important, and uh, in that in our so so in our liturgy today. Um, and I, I try and make it as hard as possible on Donna. Uh, so I uh, switch out the, during those two salutations. I switch back out with the, the, I keep the ones from Divine Service Setting 3 because I want you guys to say them with thy spirit. And the, oh, and the reason for that is because I want you to remind me of my ordination. I want you to tell, like, what you're doing is you're giving me a blessing and telling me, yes. You are the one, Pastor Myers, who God has 
uh, put in Christ's stead for us to receive these gifts. And that's not like for me to be prideful, it's humbling for me, right? It's, it's reminding me what my job is. I got a job to do here, and I want your blessing to do that job, right? I need, I need your blessing to do that job. Um, and so, so I'm blessing you, you know, the Lord be with you, and then you're, you're giving that blessing back to me and saying, no, I'm with, and with thy spirit, the spirit of the ordination that, that you receive by laying on hands. Uh, oh, okay, so I don't know how we got there. John 20, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So this um, is given to pastors to do. Uh, the office of the keys, the forgiveness of sins, uh, confession, absolution, and that is given in John. That's instituted by Christ Himself in John 20, uh, and also in Matthew 16, also recorded there. Uh, different, actually, it's two different occasions. Uh, in Matthew 16, it's when they go up on the mount. Excuse me, they go up on the mountain in private, and Jesus asks Peter, uh, "Who do people say that?" I, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they say, some say John the Baptist, so on and so forth. And, and uh, Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he says, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Um, which we can talk about what that means later if you want. But, uh, and then he says, if you, and then he says, I give to you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Right, which is where this phrase, the office of the keys, comes from. Because basically what the disciples are given is, or what, and what those who follow in the apostolic ministry are given is the, the key to heaven, right? So I can either walk a sin down and say you're not forgiven because you're not repentant, or I can open up heaven and let that forgiveness come through, right? Um, I can either bind a sin on earth or bind a sin in heaven. And uh, that's the idea of the keys, uh, the gates of the kingdom of heaven, right? So I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Uh, if you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven. If you withhold them, they are not forgiven. So uh, the same thing happens in Matthew 16. and then, But then we get this kind of ordination in John 20 after the resurrection, where he says the same thing over and over, over again. Um, what's interesting is that, and this is my last thing on this, is that in the catechism part here, uh, Luther says the office of the keys is that special authority which Christ has given to his church on earth. To forgive the sins of repentance and he doesn't say pastors and that that's kind of interesting because i mean to me the, the biblical witness is that like in both scenarios in matthew 16 and john 20 the disciples are completely isolated one time they're up on a mountain alone with jesus the other time they're in the upper room locked in a room with jesus and um so you think the office of the keys is given to pastors and lutherans will talk about it that way but Lutheran theology has also always made the point that the church has to have pastors. Like, a congregation is in need of a pastor. You can't have a congregation without a pastor. Because the pastor is the one who's given the stand in Christ's stead to, to uh, administer the word and the sacraments. And all the, the things that Christ institutes, the Lord's Supper and the Confession, absolution, and and baptism, and all these all these gifts, the preaching of the word. That's all given to pastors to do. And uh, Lutheran theology has always said, well, if there is an emergency circumstance where a congregation for some reason does not have a pastor and cannot get one, so say there's a group of Christians on a plane that crash on an island, you know. Uh, there was a TV show about that. Well, Gil gets silent, <laughs> but there was another TV, Lost. Was the, was the, you know, which I never, I never watched, but I know there's a character named Sawyer because that's what people always told. Me. <laughs> but um, like, if that happens and you've got a group of Christians on an island, and the LCMS isn't going to go send them a chaplain because they don't know they're there, right? Okay, um, then they can call a pastor, a qualified man from among themselves to serve as their pastor. And, so, and the idea there is that Christians have a right to a pastor. Christians have a right to a pastor because they have a right to the gospel. And so, um, and to receive those gifts. 
And so, uh, Lutheran theology has kind of talked about the office of the keys in this way. Well, when you think about it like that, the office of the keys is actually given as a gift to the church, for the church uh, to be able to have pastors. Um, instead of saying that it's given directly to the pastors. Now, you can talk about it in either way, right? Because not every Christian administers the office of the keys. But every Christian has a right for absolution. Does that make sense? And so that, that's also why the, the LCMS, um, even though the Bible doesn't really talk this way, uh, which I recognize and some people have a problem with, uh, the LCMS, when it talks about pastors going from one congregation to another, or when a congregation gets a pastor, it talks about it in terms of the call, right? That the, the, a congregation is calling a pastor to come to them. And that is because the congregation has this right to the gospel, which means they have a right to a pastor. And now, in the, in the Bible, whenever it talks about pastors going somewhere, it's always sent. <laughs> so that, that can be a little tricky for people um and i and i understand that that's that can be a little difficult because um some people will say well you know the, the lcms really the doctrine of the ministry doesn't really seem to line up with the bible and anyway we can we can talk about that more later but um the idea is basically that christians have a right to the gospel because the gospel is free so it's connected to justification and christ instituted pastors and he instituted these gifts to be administered by pastors and so, uh, congregations have the right to call a pastor uh, to themselves. So, anyway, that's why it says the Office of Keys is that authority which Christ has given his church on earth um, to forgive sins. Um, and I should also say that Christians can also forgive one another, right? Um, and it's not that only the pastor can administer, like, forgiveness in that sense. Although, we would, we would put that in kind of a different category, right? That's... That's not the forgiveness of sins before before God in heaven under the stead of Christ forgiveness, right? That's um, that it's a it's a special kind of forgiveness that comes with absolution. Now, and it, and again, like we've talked about before, God also gives His forgiveness in other ways too because He's abundant in mercy. So, uh, I mean, the Lord's Prayer said you pray for forgiveness in the Lord's Prayer. The idea of confession and absolution is that you have specific sins that you specifically want the guarantee of absolution for. All right. Any questions on that, Steve? Go ahead. Uh, I remember during your coronation that you wore the red vestments, you know, yeah. which depicts the Holy Spirit, and then on the front of the bulletin, it had keys on it. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a lot of symbolism in that service. Yeah, yeah, and my red stole uh, that I was ordained with because um, part of the ordination right is putting on the stole and putting on the child's bowl, uh, which hopefully is not listening to this. Dr. Pablo almost put on backwards, which is funny. Um, uh, good times. Um, the red stole uh, Rebecca made for me, and uh, one of the symbols on the bottom of it is uh, keys. Yeah. So, part in our Bible study is. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 15, more or less. We're actually in second, at the end of 2 Kings 14. And um, we're looking at Jeroboam II. So we've been doing an overview of Israel, Israel's kings in the divided kingdom. Um, and we're get, we're, it, these get shorter and shorter too because if you, if you see the, if you look at the sheet, um, if you have one of these Bible packets of... Uh, um, if you look at the divided kingdom sheet that goes through the northern and southern kingdom, Judah and Israel, um, we're down at Jeroboam the second in Israel, and we don't really have that many more to go, and I think we can try to get through them pretty quick. If you look at the references, it's like kind of all 2 Kings 15 from here on out. So just one chapter. They're pretty short. Um, I mean, 2 Kings 15 is only 38 verses. Um, these guys don't last very long, and there's not a lot of references given about them because basically what's happening um from this time forth jeroboam uh the second uh zachariah shalom menham uh pekiah pekah uh Hosea, they what what we're in is the continual downfall of israel 
right? So if you go back to um, Jeroboam the, the first, the first king of Israel, established the golden calf cult um, after the golden calf of Aaron in Exodus, and he uh, did not repent. And then basically the golden calf cult sticks around the whole time. The only time where it, it doesn't stick around is when things get worse, when they worship Baal under Ahab and Jezebel, uh, those characters, and they start doing child sacrifice and homosexual temple prostitution and all sorts of other great Canaanite religion worship. Um, and then uh, we had Jehu who destroyed the Baal worshippers, which was good, and he was rewarded for that. He got four generations of his people on the throne, but they never got rid of the golden calf, cult, right? And this is why every Israelite king is evil. Um, Jehu's maybe the best. He starts out good, uh, but then doesn't have follow through. And that's something we've been talking about with the last couple of kings, is that some of these kings, it's like, what are you thinking? Because they will talk to Elisha or talk to whoever the prophet is, and they'll learn exactly what they need to do, and God will show them mercy and save them from an Assyrian raid, and then they just flop. They just don't, they don't follow through, right? And the Lord's mission requires follow through. Um, so what we have here is this continual downfall of this nation because they don't repent. And one thing we've been kind of talking about as a um, common thread throughout this is that in the throughout the history, throughout the history of the world and throughout the Bible, uh, there are collective punishments. <clears throat> Sorry, I, I lost my words for a second. There are collective punishments for uh, collective sins. So it's not that every single person in Israel, in the in the Northern Kingdom, is evil, right? And, and, I mean, the prophets themselves, right, uh, are, are good. And when Elijah is in the cave and he thinks, there's no one good left here. What does God say to him? There's still a remnant. There's still a remnant. Uh, they're, still, they're still faithful that I preserve for myself, right? But that doesn't mean that Israel is still not punished. And God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. It takes him, like, I mean, he could have sent them into captivity well before this and been totally justified, right? Which is, this is, this is our story with uh, God, too, is that God would be justified to send every human since Adam to hell. God would be justified. We're all poor, miserable sinners. We've all inherited the sin of Adam. We've all acted on it. Um, <coughs> And uh, none of us is righteous, no, not one. Right, Romans 3. Yeah, if you, if you need to be reminded of that, read Romans 3. Um, but he's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And he gives opportunities, abundant opportunities, over and over again for mercy. That said, he does carry out justice. And so this collective punishment that's coming upon Israel... You can see it growing and growing and growing throughout these kings. There's um, the Assyrian Empire is forming, right, uh, to the northeast of them. If you look at that that map, any of those maps, the Assyrian Empire is forming, and they are continually raiding and attacking uh, Israel. And eventually, um, they're going to get taken into captivity. They're going to get taken into captivity. So anyhow. That brings us, uh, as kind of a review, that brings us to Jeroboam II, who we'll just cover quickly. I've got to check my time here. Um, so Jeroboam is the uh, successor of Joash, uh, son of Joash, and he reigns for quite a while. He's named after the first Jeroboam, uh, who established the golden calf cult. <laughs> And um, he, what, what's probably the most interesting about Jeroboam the second is that he has multiple prophecies and prophetic encounters from other prophets. Uh, so, 
in Amos 7 9, which uh, uh, 722 BC, uh, which, let's see, yeah, let's see. I was trying to remember if he's a contemporary. Yeah, 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 he is a contemporary of Amos. So Amos is around um, during the reign of Jeroboam II. And so in Amos 7 9, it reads, <clears throat> The high places of Isaac will be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel will be ruined. I will rise up against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. And uh, he's obviously talking there about the contemporary, not Jeroboam the first, but the contemporary Jeroboam, Jeroboam the second. And so Amos prophesies against the house of Jeroboam because of his commitment to evil. Um, and then uh, this is fulfilled uh, when Zechariah, the next uh, king, uh, takes over and, and kills him with the sword when he takes over. Right? So, so by the Lord's hand, Zechariah uh, kills Jeroboam II with the sword. The other prophetic thing that happens in Jeroboam's life is... Um, as this continued punishment is going on, um, they keep getting crunched on by Syria, and uh, Israel's continued existence is completely in doubt. Um, he uh, decides to go on a military campaign to gain back lost territory. And he does this at uh, the prompting of Jonah. So I believe this is in 2 Kings, at the end of 2 Kings 14, uh, 24, 26. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not turn from all the sins which Jeroboam, son of Nebat, caused Israel to commit. It was he who restored the boundary of Israel from Lebo, Hamath, to the Dead Sea, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, had spoken to him through his servant, the prophet Jonah, son of Amittai. Uh, and Jonah, son of Amittai, is the prophet about, from the book of Jonah. So sometimes we read the book of Jonah and, you know, we just think Jonah is the guy with the well who ran away and who soaked under the tree, right? Like that's, that's what Jonah did. Uh, but if you remember from the first chapter of Jonah, um, he's already, like, he already is a prophet when God calls on him. Um, and he wasn't that necessarily that lousy of a prophet either. I mean, we don't get like that many stories about him, but... This is the time when Jonah happens, uh, this 700s BC, and uh, this is uh, an instance where Jonah prophesied, as commanded by the Lord, to one of the kings, and uh, he actually, and it and it works, right? And again, this is an instance of the Lord having being slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love using one of his prophets to call a king to repentance, uh, to uh, fight the, the fight of the land of the people of Israel, and um, he does so. And it, it's actually amazing what he regains. So you can't even see uh, Lebo Hamath on the map, on the divided king map. So the divided king map um, only shows up north to Damascus. Uh, Lebo Hamath is like up here. If that makes sense. It's uh, it's far north, and the Dead Sea is uh, this sea right here. He takes like this whole strip of land back uh, for the people of Israel, and and that's pretty that's pretty amazing. Um, do I have a uh, exile map on here? Yeah. So. Um, yeah, the red line probably goes right up there. Right, yeah, the red line on that exile map goes right up there. Um, it, it's it's almost it's almost up to the Actually, I'm pretty sure that that where that red line goes, there's like a little uh, sea, and I can't remember what the name of that sea is. There's a little sea up north um, there where that red line is. I think that's pretty close to Lebo Hana, uh, if I if I remember correctly from the atlas. So, um, and then Assyrian Empire, obviously, is going to extend back over there. So it is amazing that he takes back this much land, at least for a short time, um, just on the word of the prophet Jonah. 
And, and it just goes to show you when the Lord blesses what you do when you follow his word, right? Because when a, when a prophet speaks a word, what is that? That's scripture, right? That's the word of the Lord. So when you follow the word of the Lord, things work. <laughs> um, it, that, that's just sim simply how things go. Uh, all right. So that's Jeroboam the second. But then he never repents of the golden calf bull, of course. And Zechariah uh, strikes him down. Uh, what time is it? About one minute. So. Okay. Well, I'm not going to start Zechariah yet. Um, well, actually, you know, it's like one paragraph. Um, so I'll just read this from 2 Kings 15, starting at verse 8. Um, in 1 through 8, you have a Ju Judah king, which will do when we do Judah's kings. Uh, in the 38th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Zechariah, son of Jeroboam, ruled as king over Israel in Samaria for six whole months. Six months. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father's done, did not turn from the sins. Jeroboam, son of Nebat, of course. Shalom, son of Jabesh, conspired to kill him. He struck him down in front of the people. Um, as for the rest of Zechariah's acts, you can find them in the annals of the kings. Uh, so on and so forth. Um, and note that Zechariah is the fourth and final generation of the blessing that was given to Jehu, of the sons of Jehu that get to reign on the throne because Jehu did strike down the Baal worship that was going. Anyway, I was, I was trying to find where Zechariah kills Jeroboam, but uh, I, I might just say that in, I know, it, I mean, it references it in Amos. It might say it in Second Chronicles somewhere. Um, anyway, but Zechariah killed Jeroboam. So we really don't get a lot of information about Zechariah. Um, and uh, he just is kind of this placeholder king, right? Uh, the same, and the, the same thing is kind of going to be Shalom, Shalom too, is these placeholder kings that don't uh, reign very long. And this is just a continued downfall. They don't repent of the golden calf cult. They go the way of the world, and eventually they're going to go into captivity because of this. So, uh, yeah, we get Zechariah there, and then we can read a little bit about Shalom later. Uh, but they basically just keep assassinating each other at this point to become king for like a short time. And they'll go into captivity. So, uh, the, there's an interesting thing about Men, Men, Menahem, uh, who we'll talk about next week probably too. So, um, he tries to buy off. Uh, their slavery from Assyria, which works temporarily, but we'll talk about that next week. Any questions, thoughts, comments on anything? <clears throat> Let's end in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to be true King over heaven and earth, and we pray that the day would come soon where he would descend from on high to come and judge the living and the dead, that we would live in the new heavens and the new earth under his kingship and reign perfectly for the rest of eternity. We pray that you would uh, bless pastors and ministers of your church, that they would be faithful in executing the office of the keys, which has been given to them. We pray that all Christians would have the gospel fully and freely proclaimed to them. And we pray that you would bless our worship today together, that you would open the hearts and minds of everyone here to hear your word and to receive your gifts. We pray all this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.